Our Father, we thank you because we know that when the troubles of this world are over, when the work is done, when the harvest has been reaped, and when the sound of the trumpet will be heard, we, your children, who have been involved in the work, will be going home. And Lord, we are praying that we'll be so faithful and so loyal and so obedient that at this time, we'll put all we have into your work so that on that day, when you'll call us home, one by one, you'll grant us rewards. You'll be able to tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a little thing. And be that ruler over ten cities or five cities or two cities, whichever the case will be. Father, we pray that none of us will lose our crown in Jesus' name. And we pray that there will be stars in our crown too. We pray that you help us to do what we ought to do. So that at this time of laboring, this time of harvesting, this time of working, we'll all do our best in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Already we have listened to a lot of messages, the main messages that came out of the pulpit here, as well as seminars that showed us practical things as to what to do. No doubt you've got a vision already. And no doubt the vision you had before had been rekindled. And now with new zeal, you're about to go to the places you have come from. And it will be fitting to show you how to keep the vision. I'll go through with you in the Acts of the Apostles in particular to show you the concept of vision in the Acts of the Apostles. That the concept of vision in the Acts majors on one central fact and one central truth. Prophets of old saw visions. And the people of the Old Testament, the Old Dispensation, they saw visions. And even at the time of the Gospels, when Jesus Christ was here, there were a few cases referred to concerning the apostles as to the vision of the, on the Mount of Transfiguration that they saw. There also was the vision that the shepherd saw of the angel announcing the birth and singing about the birth of Jesus Christ. But when you come to the Acts of the Apostles, from the day of Pentecost onward, the visions of the Acts centers on something very major, something very central, something very definitely deep in the heart of a mighty God. That's what we're thinking of and talking about today. The vision. Receiving it, retaining it, keeping it, going along with it. In Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 17, And it shall come to pass that in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy that happened on the day of Pentecost and there are groups that have looked at these verses and they have thought that they are following the new dispensation they are following the Pentecostal line. And then in their meetings, they say they are following the blueprint of the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, we have been told in the last days, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. And then it says your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And so you have different groups of religious people. Some of them not born again, like the white garment churches. And they center all their worship on the visions and the prophecies and the dreams. They have not bothered to check up. 
the central truth about prophecies in the New Testament and see the prophetic utterances, especially in the authentic history of the church, and see the direction of the prophecies that they received in the Acts of the Apostles. And so you have a lot of prophecies concerning if you want to get married, if you want to get a job, if you want to have a problem solved, if somebody is owing you money, if you are living in a particular house, a lot of prophecies that they give out as to what the climate will look like next week, as to whether we can go on trading, as to whether you can go to the market, as to whether you can eat rice or fufu, as to whether you can sit on a chair or sit on a bench, as to where do you go, when do you go? Should you travel out today? Shouldn't you travel out today? That's where the prophecies of those churches center. And then there are people that dwell with that they deal much with dreams. And they tell us that they have a lot of dreams. And a lot of the dreams they have com uh, completely contradict the word of God, the written word of God. They tell you they are following the line of action they are following because of the dream God gave to them. You say, but it's contrary to the word of God. Well, they say, well, I don't know about that. What I know is that the Bible is what God said in the past. My dream is what God is saying today. And if one contradicts the other, then their dreams will be exalted above the reaching word of God because that's new, because that's fresh, because they say that's what he's saying today. Not recognizing and not knowing that God will never change his word. That if he's going to give any dream today, and he does give he, he gives a dream today. But if he gives any dream today, it will not contradict any doctrine of the Bible. It will not teach anything contrary to thus says the Lord in the word of God. Why will the Almighty God 3,808 times say, thus says the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me. All those times and then now give a dream to somebody. To contradict what is said 3,800 over and over and over again. That doesn't sound reasonable. It says, he that has a dream, let him tell the dream. He that has my word, let him speak my word. But then it says, what is chaff to the wheat? Because my word is like hammer that breaks the stony hearts into pieces. It says, my word is like fire that burns all the chaff. That burns all the things that are not stable. That will be driven away by the wind. And there are people today that will center everything they believe, everything they do, everywhere they go, on the dreams they have. And then there are people that will say, don't you see any vision? We see visions. We look at what God is doing today. And then they come to the assembly, or they come to their house meeting, or they come to their charismatic group, and they say, I saw a vision that tomorrow, days and days will happen in the country. I saw a vision that between the army and the police, this will be going on next year. I saw a vision between the military and the political people, this is what will be going on. I saw a vision concerning the constituent assembly. I saw a vision. I saw a vision. Somebody is getting married. I saw a vision. Somebody is going to work. I saw a vision. Somebody is going to die. I saw a vision. Somebody is going to have twin babies. Visions. But they have not bothered to check out. The visions of the New Testament. And so you have a lot of people. One, you have some people outside deep alive that challenge us. They say, are you not following after the New Testament? And we tell them, yes, we do. Seriously so. Are you not following after everything that is given in that New Testament? You better believe line upon line, precept upon precept. We follow everything. But then... When we came to your assembly, we didn't hear the people telling their dreams and the interpreters rising up and telling the interpretation of their dreams. Yes, we say we don't. And while you are preaching, we don't hear your preacher, especially the general superintendent in the middle of his message, begin to speak in tongues. Yes, we don't. Rather speak five words than speak a thousand words in the assembly that will not be understood. And I teach them as a teacher of the word of God. And tell them how to get to heaven. Rather than in the middle of the message begin to uh, speak in tongues. Or even during the prayer. So that the members of the church will now carry that and copy that. And go back to their 
fellowships and back to their meetings and then also be repeating what the state pastor has been speaking in tongues. We don't do that. They do that in any state. They are going astray. They are following after something else. But you see, they challenge us. And they tell us, don't you uh, believe in tongues? Yes, we believe, but not for display, not for pride. It is not for us to show that other fellow what I've got, what I've not got, is to minister to the needs of the people. And when you preach, preach. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I told you last night, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their itching ears, they'll heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. But do that the work of an evangelist. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. And when you go back to your states, preach. Preach the word. And if you do not go beyond preaching the word, that's enough. If you do not have any other thing, stay by the word. And the people went out and they preached the word. The Lord confirming the word with signs following. He's not going to confirm your feeling and your ideas and your opinions and all your emotional things that you are passing out. Preach the word. And so they challenge us from all these other churches. And they say, are you not Pentecostal? Yes and no. We're Pentecostal if you think about the Bible, being Pentecostal. We're not Pentecostal if you think about Assemblies of God, you think about the Four Square Church, you think about all those other Pentecostal churches that fall down while they are praying for them, that the clothes of the woman will be this way and the clothes of the other fellow and the head here will be the other way. They are slain under the Spirit. Uh-uh, we're not Pentecostal to the point of getting naked in the fellowship. Now the full gospel people will ask us, full gospel businessmen, fellowship international, the people that are over here, with all the jewelry, with all the painting, with all the palming, with everything that they are doing, they will say, are you not Pentecostal? No, not in the sense in which you take being Pentecostal. That we come into a particular place and then somebody rises up, they won't allow us to teach the word, the deep word, the authoritative word, the word from cover to cover, the complete word of God that teaches everything in the Bible. And all that they do is, you know, they come together, speak in tongues, make some interpretation, pray for the people, fall down, cast devils out from those who are, who are already born again, cast devils out of those already baptized in the Holy Ghost, cast devils out of those already preaching the gospel. We're not Pentecostal in that line. We're Pentecostal in the line of Acts of the Apostles. When you come into our meetings like this and they don't hear us, teaching people how to speak in tongues and say, brother, speak out, brother, speak out. And then we say, blah, blah, blah. And then so we say, repeat that, repeat that. It will come. You start in the flesh. It comes in the spirit. And when they don't see that, that we don't tell them to start in the flesh and then come in the spirit, they begin to challenge us. Ah, ah, ah. We thought that you're a deep like Bible church. Don't you take the whole Bible? Yes, we take the whole Bible. We have never found where Peter the apostle went to somebody and said, now speak after me, speaking in tongues. They didn't do that in the house of Cornelius. They got something genuine, not something borrowed, not something copied, not something fake, not a counterfeit. And if somebody has got you into a corner somewhere, whichever state you are coming from, and he has said, now speak after me, that's not Holy Ghost baptism. That's make-believe. That deceit. That's giving the people silver instead of gold. That's giving the people counterfeit instead of something genuine, something real. And so you find in all those full gospel, full gospel churches, full gospel businessmen fellowship, that they will still be speaking in tongues, but they're still being oppressed by the devil, harassed by the devil, tormented by the devil. They cannot sit under the straight teaching of the word of God. They will reject it. How can somebody have the spirit of truth inside? He hears the truth. His mind will never say yes, amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. That is the word of God. Show me a man that is full of the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth. And we read the word of God. Herein do I exercise myself. Always to have a conscience void of offense toward God and man. Holy Ghost man says, I reject that. I don't like that. If you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember, somebody has something against you. He says, leave your gift at the altar, go back and reconcile with him. Holy Ghost woman said, no, I reject that. 
and then women, that you adorn yourself with modest apparel, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. For so the holy women of old, the saints of old, they dressed and they were not flamboyant. They were not showing up. Holy Ghost woman will say, no, I don't accept that. That's Holy Ghost. And so the challengers, they say, don't you have Holy Ghost? Are you not at liberty? Oh yes, we're at liberty. Oh, but we don't see the liberty. When Jesus preached, did you see, was there liberty there? Was there power there? I think so. Because Christ himself is the one that came to set the people free from all their bondages. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To bring deliverance to the captives. If you want to see the height of liberty, the depth of liberty. Look at the meetings of Jesus Christ. Now tell me. Are the meetings of Jesus Christ, or the women embracing the men? The men kissing the women? At the meetings of Jesus Christ, were they holding one another, shaking one another? And then, or what they should have been doing with husband and wife in their bedroom, doing that in the church of God, in the presence of Christ? Uh -uh. The one who brought that liberty, the one who emphasized that liberty, he didn't do that. But then they tell us, oh, they say, you are not at liberty, we are at liberty, as much as Jesus was in liberty. We're at liberty. As much as Paul the Apostle, who said, Let there be no filthiness, no filthiness, be among you, not once named. We're at much liberty as Paul the Apostle was at liberty. But you know the challengers. Oh, they say, We don't see the Holy Ghost making people fall down. No, He makes us stand up. In persecution, he makes us stand. In opposition, He makes us stand. And in all the vicissitudes and all the situations, circumstances of life, the Holy Ghost makes us stand. It doesn't make us fall. We stand. And we stand firm. It makes us stand on the truth of, of, this, of the ages. The word of God. The word of the kingdom. We keep standing. And it's the Holy Ghost that makes us do it. I don't understand the Holy Ghost that will make some people fall in the assembly. When they go to their houses, they cannot take a stand for any single verse of the Bible. They cannot take a stand for... The unbeliever, the believer should not marry an unbeliever. Holy Ghost woman cannot stand on that. Charismatic man, charismatic woman cannot stand. Be not, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He cannot stand on that. That's not Holy Ghost. That's child's play. That the seat of the devil. And all deeper life is not part of all those things. Deeper life is standing on the truth of God. We have been told, honestly contained. For the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's why we're still standing. And by the grace of God, until Jesus comes, that's where we'll be standing. To be a light, to be a standard unto all the other people that when they are falling and they come in here, they see orderliness. They see decency. They see the women, how they are comp uh, their comportment. They see the men, how they are submissive. They see the orderliness and the decency and the authority and the word of God and the interaction and the cooperation in the family of God. Then they'll go back and they'll say, we have never seen it like this before. And so the challengers about vision and about dreams and about prophecy. And then too, there are people in our midst here. They have just come into the fold. Maybe they came from a Pentecostal background that is contemporary Pentecostal, not biblical Pentecostal background, but contemporary Pentecostal background. And then as they came in, oh, they said, that's too cold, the quietness, that's too embarrassing for them. But quietness, when everywhere is dead quiet, and the spirit of the living God begins to break down people. He begins to convict people in the quietness of the atmosphere of the fellowship. That's not deadness. The spirit of God can be moving when we're all quiet, assimilating, drinking in the word of God. But they want it all noise. So they are not happy with our regular fellowship. They are not happy with our regular Sunday worship. It's too cold for them. They are not happy with our regular Tuesday Bible study. 
that's too cold for them. They're not happy with a regular miracle revival on Friday. Even that one is still too cold for them. Therefore, they'll bring some of our own members, some of the people that came a long time ago. And those people should be their teachers. But those people themselves, I don't know what they have been doing in the church for 10 years, for 7 years, for 8 years. So these people that just came, that those who have been here before should say, sit down, let me teach you. Let me tell you what has been going on since 1973. Let me tell you about the retreats we held when the power of God moved and many people were swept into the kingdom of God and the wind of the spirit blew and blew their tobacco out of their mouth and blew their, their bottles out of their fridges and blew everything that was immoral out of their lives. Let me show you the retreats we may have in before you came when the spirit of God moved in such a dynamic way and moved the woman out of the house of adultery and moved that woman into the house of the real lost man. That's the real moving of the spirit of God. Let me tell you the story. But they don't know any story to tell. So all these people that just came from full gospel, from charismatic, from Pentecostal, and from Chirmo and Seraphim, from Celestial Church, oh, they will say, ah, ah, why are we so cold in deeper life? We have the word, but we don't have the spirit. I have the spirit. I don't know about you. The word and the spirit. But they say they have the word, they don't have the spirit. Let's keep it moving. So what do they do? They go to night vigil somewhere. Not a program of the church. They want to have opportunity of speaking in tongues, interpreting prophecy. And before you know what is happening, in that little circle in the night, they say, Sister so and so, such and such is your husband. Thus says the Lord. Brother so and so, that restitution you are thinking about, the Lord says no. I've forgotten about it. I've forgiven you. Thus says the Lord. That woman will have many children for you. will be a blessing to your life. That's prophecy. And right in their night vigil, where they say they are praying, they destroyed all the foundation we have laid. And all these old people that came 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 7 years ago, 8 years ago, oh, they say, praise the Lord, the Spirit is moving now. Well, our state of Asia does not understand this, but we are not going to stand in the way of the Spirit of God. If this work be of God, nobody can destroy it, no announcement can cancel it, we are going to do it. And then they tell other people in our fellowship, they say, something is moving somewhere, something, we are hearing the voice of God, we are seeing the visions of the Almighty all through the night from 9, from 9 p.m., to 5 a.m. in the morning, we don't sleep at all. We sing, we, we sing in tongues, we talk in tongues, we make interpretation, we do everything. Oh my, my, the Spirit of God is moving. I even feel it now. The Spirit of God is upon me now. The Lord tells me to tell you, you must be part of that night vigil. If you are not part of that night vigil, something will happen to you. I'm praying that the cause of God will not be upon your life. Thus says the Lord, Amen, 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 Amen. And that other one is deceived also. Goes into the night vigil, fall a lie. When they have the Spirit of God, they'll be submissive to the pastor of the church. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that you must be obedient to those who have the rule over you. So that they will do it with joy. But we're all running after you. So and so is in that video, bring him back. So and so is in that video, bring her back. So and so who made restitution long ago, a revelation vision has come that that restitution was a mistake. Let her now go back. So and so that was having a, that was living with the second wife and has been considered a situation, thus says the Lord, that is no more necessary now. That's not Pentecostalism, that's counterfeit. That's of the devil. Something that contradicts the word of God. And so the challengers, even our own members here, oh they say, ah, oh, we are members of deeper life. So if we see we ought to talk, this is coach, this is not good enough. We want something more lively. Well, be patient. You have just come. You came two years ago. What do you think? You think that those of us who have been here now for more than 15 years in deeper life, you think we are foolish? You think you have seen something we have not seen? You have discovered something from uh, a treasure from the field somewhere that we have not got? We've gone over that field before. That treasure you think you have discovered, we've discovered more than that. If you are wise, You'll be patient. You'll say, let me watch and see. And you'll see the moving of the Lord. You'll see the power of the Holy Ghost. And the greatest manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost is when it changes lives. And we cannot tell you, the thousands and thousands and thousands of people 
that the Spirit of God has come upon and lives have been changed. So be patient. And do not just go away and say, well, we've now got a new vision, we've now got a new dream, we've now got a new prophecy. That's not the way. And so, let's not leave all the challenges of those people and begin to ask ourselves, what's the real vision in the history of the authentic church? The vision. Now let's see, I'll get through with you to some of the passages of Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 9. I'm reading verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. Now this vision is related to the Great Commission. The Lord had told his own people, and he has said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They lay their hands on the sick. They shall recover. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall speak with new tongues. And then it says they will take up serpents as well. And the people went out. Now Paul the Apostle, as Saul at that time, he was coming from Jerusalem with letters of authority in his hand to persecute, to oppose, if possible, if he could, to cancel anything that they called the religion of the Jesus of Nazarene. And on the way, Jesus spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the priests who are thou, Lord, and Jesus whom you persecute. What shall I do? Go to, the, go to Damascus. It will be shown you what you will do. And here was Ananias, a child of God, a believer. And the Lord went to him in a vision. And the vision was connected with the Great Commission. The vision was connected with pulling somebody out of his rebellion. Pulling somebody out of his sin. Pulling somebody out of all the iniquities that he had been doing. And giving him assurance that the Lord will met you in the way, brother Saul. The Lord who has changed your life now. The Lord who is changing the direction of your life. Has sent me unto you that you will receive your sight. This sign shall follow them. That's the vision. It is to confirm what Jesus had said before. It is not a new vision. That is to say something that has no relationship with the work of God, with the Great Commission, with the thing that Jesus left with the apostles. And so he went to him on the basis of that vision and confirmed all that the Lord had been talking to him about. Then Acts chapter 10, from verse 17. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold the man which was sent from Cornelius, had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon who was so named Peter were lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Again, this is connected with bringing Cornelius and his household fuller, deeper into the faith, into the household of God. Cornelius had seen an angel, and the angel had said, your prayer is come as a memorial before God, but then you must send for Peter. The work has been committed into the hands of the apostles, into the hands of the church, not into the hands of the angels. I, I could have told you, but I cannot tell you. That's not my ministry. Listen to me. The angels of God will not usurp the authority of the apostles. They knew that wasn't the assignment. And so this angel, angel, coming from heaven, he told Cornelius, I can tell you, I can show you. I know what to say, but I can't say it. I know how you can come in fuller and deeper and richer into the faith, into the kingdom, but I can't tell you. But there is a man that God has put that work in their hand, sent to him. He is not here now. You know what some people say? 
oh, the people say, since the pastor is not around, uh, we mustn't think that we'll wait like that. We know we're not supposed to do this, but we'll do it in any case, because after all, the pastor is not available. After all, the state overseer is not available. After all, the district pastor is not available. Well, even an angel will not usurp the authority of, Paul, of Peter, the apostle of God, into whose hands the work had been committed. Now, you are taking a lot for granted and you don't understand. And many of you, you might be saying, well, I felt moved because the pastor is slow. Peter was slow. When God spoke to Peter, Peter said, Lord, not so. Nothing like that has ever entered my mouth. And God said, what God has cleansed, call not thou unclean or common. He showed him again. He said, Peter, arise and eat. There is a work for you among the Gentiles. Peter said, no, I'm sorry. Uh -uh. If Peter was slow like that, why didn't the angel that had no problem? Why didn't the angel that had no reservation? Why didn't the angel that had uh, no partiality? Why didn't the angel that has more strength, more power, more understanding? Why didn't the angel tell Cornelius he will not? That's the Bible. And you find all these people running about. We, say, we tell them that house fellowship is only to do this. Not more than that. We put out land in their hand. Then they usurp the authority of the pastor of their branch. They go beyond house fellowship. They give time for counseling. They, not only that they give time for counseling, they say, go and call somebody from another zone. Tell them that I am the prayer warrior here. I'm not just ordinary house fellowship leader. Go and tell them, what our pastor cannot do, God has put me here in this corner of the area to be doing it. Go and be calling them. But the person, I've given the person that uh, should go and see the state overseer who is state over. I said, go and call the man. I want to talk to him. That uh, you don't know me. He doesn't know you. You are a wolf in sheep's clothing. You are a robber. You are the one you're stopping the authority of the pastor of your own church. You are the one you're stopping the authority of the state leader, the state overseer. What a pity they didn't know you. But you see the angel. The angel said, you go and tell Peter. And tell him that he should come over here and he will tell you. I can't do his work for him. And you can't do my work for me. Sometimes, even as state overseers, I overheard on Wednesday when you came, that they have been discussing among themselves. The GS is too slow. The GS is this, the GS is that. I send the person that told me, go and tell them. I'm not their equal. We're not on the same bench. I'm their father in the Lord. All they know, I taught them. Everything they have ever heard that we call sound doctrine, we didn't borrow any of them from outside, from another church. Everything I taught them, and they shouldn't forget, a father is still a father. How, what right do you have that the pastor is slow? Look at the church. More than 50,000 adults on Sunday in church, a pastor is slow. Look at the church, a children's church, more than 12,000, the pastor is slow. Look at the building that we have here, the pastor is slow. Look at the IBTC, look at the work that is going on. Look at the miracles that are happening. What have you seen? What have you done? That a state overseer will discuss with any other state overseer and say, Pastor is low. GS is low. Therefore, let us go to him. You are lucky you didn't come. You had come, I would have told you to your face that you are now going beyond your level. Maybe because I have been too close to you, trying to help you. Trying to tell you, do it this way and do it this way and put my life on the table for you and tell you that this is how to go. I won't take that. That's not biblical. Therefore, all those people, state overseers, see yourselves again and talk to one another and repent of ever saying, the pastor, the GS is low on this, on that. This church is not based on secular administration. Whoever went to university, I also went, but we don't use that here. Whoever went to university and learned anything, when you come into this place, you throw it in the latrine. You say, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Don't bring secular political administration and grumbling and gossiping about the general superintendent into a church like this. This church is different. And so, many people will say, Peter was slow. Oh yes, he was slow. But God dealt with him. Leave Peter with God. Leave the apostle with God. And in Lagos here, the coordinators, I think they understand. 
The sonar leaders, I think they understand. I don't think the people in Lagos will have a meeting at the background. Well, if they do, they are rebelling. And I didn't tell you this before, but I'll tell you. The Bible says, touch not the anointed of God. If you don't know anybody that is anointed in deeper life, the general superintendent of deeper life is anointed. To open the eyes of the blind. To make the lame to walk. To bring many people into the kingdom of God. And you do not touch the anointed of the Lord. Because for this generation, and for this nation, I have a work, I have a ministry, I have a vision, and I have something that is being carried out. And so what are we all to do? We're all just to support that vision, go along with that vision, instead of staying at the back and discussing and grumbling and gossiping and saying that somebody is too slow, this one is not being done, this one is not being done. What did you see that has not been done? Look at everything that is going on and just look up to the Lord and say, Lord, this is what your hands have made. It's marvelous in our eyes. Have you ever seen something like this in Africa before? Have you ever seen something like this so orderly? And so biblical and so authoritative in the word of God. Have you seen any ministry like this before? I told you about the Bendel State Crusade. I told all the workers to go around and to go and look at the people that have short legs and stay there and open their eyes. And when I gave the word of command, all those people that opened their eyes, they saw the short legs and the short hands growing out. That's authority. You don't touch a man like that. You're not dealing with celestial church that doesn't have Bible. You are not dealing with all the other churches that do not have spiritual divine authority upon their personal lives, upon their ministries. Do not touch the anointed of the Lord. Be very, very careful. And so, the angel did not usurp the authority of Peter. He said, you sent for Peter. And the third time, the vision came to Peter again. And God said, Peter, Simon, rise up and eat. And he said so again, O oh Lord, Nothing unclean or common has ever entered into my mouth. And uh, God left him alone. Then he came back. Then the spirit interpreted the vision to him and told him that three men are seeking for thee. And eventually he went with them. The point is this. That vision was related to bringing people into fuller and deeper into the kingdom of God. And we need to understand that when we talk about visions and revelations in the New Testament, in line with the revelation of the Acts of the Apostles, it is to support, it is to assist, it is to help the Great Commission one way or the other. In Acts chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia. And prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. You see that vision again? Paul the Apostle, he saw the vision by night. And again, it's related to come and help us. When we saw that vision, we are assuredly gathered without any iota of doubt in our minds that the Lord has called us to preach the gospel unto them. Again in Acts chapter 18, verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Now you can see that in different parts of the New Testament, the vision is related to preaching the gospel, bringing people into the kingdom of God. And so if we're still having that same mind today, we'll understand that when the Lord, the greatest visions that God is interested in giving us, the highest vision that God is interested in showing us, is the vision that will fulfill the Great Commission. It's a vision that will pluck many people out of eternal fire. It's a vision that will make the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse the people. It's a vision that will make you to go out and reach out and call the people into the kingdom of God. Paul the Apostle said unto King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26 and verse 19, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, 
Immediately, he said that, he said in verse 20, But I showed first unto them of Damascus, in the fulfillment of that vision, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do the works meet for repentance. Paul the Apostle said, I received that vision, and have not been disobedient to that heavenly vision. I have retained it, I have maintained it, I have kept to it, and I've walked in line with the vision. Now, how do you keep the vision? Now, after you have got the vision, to start with, you understand, the vision is related to the vision of the lost, that the people are perishing. You need to go out in every village, in every city, in every local government area, in every state, in the whole of this nation. Go out, reach out with the gospel. How do you maintain such a vision that God has given you? The vision to evangelize. The vision to preach to the people that they need not perish. Jesus died for them. Number one, you read, you hear, you meditate, you pray often on the vision to reach the lost. You see, out of sight is out of mind. If you do not read much about passion for souls, about evangelizing, about reaching out to the people that are lost and bringing them to the kingdom of God, if you don't read often about it, you'll not be able to keep the vision. If you do not hear often about it, you'll not be able to keep the vision. If you do not meditate on it, just sit down and meditate on the people that are getting lost. Just meditate on the multitudes that are dying daily. Just meditate on the people that have been in bondage to all the religions of the world. Just meditate on what you can do today. Just meditate on how God can use you to bring people away from hell, from the way to hell, and bring them from the way to the way to heaven. Read and hear and meditate and pray very, very often, very, very frequently concerning the vision of preaching the laws. Number two, the way to keep the vision. You reject every proposal. You reject every plan. You reject every attraction that will hinder the fulfillment of the vision to evangelize. A lot of things will come up in your life which the devil will try to use to rob the vision away from your sight, to take the passion away from your spirit, to take the fire away from your being. There are a lot of attractions, side attractions, there are a lot of thoughts, there are a lot of plans, a lot of projects that the devil will give to hinder you, but you reject everything that will stand as a hindrance in fulfilling the great commission Anything that will make you lose passion for souls, you reject everything. Any friend, any neighbor, any acquaintance that will make you to be robbed of the vision to save the lost, you keep apart from him. You get closer to what you are reading, closer to what you are hearing, closer to what you are meditating on, closer to what you are praying about. You say, I have just a single life. And that single life must be used, must be spent on the work of the Lord. And this single life must not be wasted, must not be squandered. I must reach out, I must tell the Lord that the Savior has died for them. And you'll reject any proposal from anybody that will hinder you from fulfilling the great commission in your life. That's how to maintain the vision. But if you allow... The things of this world, the desires for other things, to just press out and crush out and squeeze out the vision from your heart or from your spirit. You will not be able to keep the vision and you will not be able to go ahead and do it the way Paul the Apostle did. When he said, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Number three, have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ that we always say, let us go to the next towns, for therefore am I sent for. The mind of God that will, the mind of Christ that will always say, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. The mind of Christ that always said that I must walk while yet there is day. The night is coming when no man can walk. The mind of Christ that is consumed by the zeal of the Lord. 
the mind of Christ that will consider the value of a soul. And even must need go through Samaria so as to meet a woman there who needs to be saved, who needs the water of life. Every consideration of your life, every vision that you have, every thought of your heart, every desire of your life, every plan of your life will have the great commission in consideration and you will always consider the value of souls. It is your daily thought. It is your daily meditation that what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? You know the value of a soul. You know that they will never die. Where they are warm, dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And because of that, this mind of Christ will make you to say, He has sent me to seek and to save that which was lost. And you know, He has passed that across to you, saying, You go, occupy until I come. Number one, you hear, you read, you meditate, you pray on the Great Commission. On the vision to evangelize very, very often, frequently. Number two, you reject every proposal. You reject every plan. You reject every side attraction that will hinder the vision or make you lose the passion for souls. Number three, you'll have the mind of Christ and you will consider, always consider, the value of the never dying souls around you. Number four, you seek after those souls. As merchants will seek after wealth, you seek after those souls as the thirsty will seek after water. You seek after those souls as the hungry will seek after food. You seek after those souls as the people of this world who have made money the God of their lives as they are seeking after the wealth of the world. You seek after souls as Jesus Christ went about seeking for souls. You seek after souls and you will not count any journey too long any mountain too high, any valley too deep, any sea too wide, any difficulty too great for you to pass through and get through when you are seeking for a soul. You will not mind for the storm that comes on the ocean, on the sea. When there is a demoniac on the other side of the sea, you are seeking for them. You are seeking for them and you will seek until you find. You are seeking the lost. You are seeking the backsliders. You're seeking the people that have never known. You're seeking the people that have never heard. You're seeking the people that have never got the gospel. And they have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior. You're seeking after those souls so that you evangelize while the vision is fresh. You start doing it while the vision is fresh. You start doing it while the vision is still fresh on your mind. While the Lord is saying, I've spoken to you. Get up and do the work. At that very time, you begin doing the work and you preach everywhere you can find people. On the street, in the bus, in a taxi, in your community, at your yard, in the house where you are living, in the school where you are teaching, in the school where you are learning, or in the office where you are working. You make sure that you are seeking after the souls. When you look at them, you are not looking at their silver and gold. When you look at them, you are not looking at their wealth or honor. When you look at them, you are not looking at their position or power. When you look at them, you are not trying to get something out of them. When you look at them, you are not trying to get a favor out of them. When you look at them, you are seeking for what is inside them. You are seeking for their souls. On behalf of Christ, as an ambassador of Christ, as a soldier of Christ, as a servant of the Lord, you are seeking after them. Just like Christ would have been seeking after them if he were here. And you begin to evangelize while the vision is fresh right now. Number five, you share the vision with others and you move them to passion for souls. When you have it, you talk about it to believers. And you move other believers to have the same vision, to evangelize, to fulfill the great commission. While you are sharing to other people, it, it becomes broadened and deepened and heightened in your life. While you are sharing that vision and you are saying, my brother's souls are perishing, my sister's souls are perishing, and God has given me this fire, this vision, this uh, thing that just puts me on the go to reach out to the souls. And then you move on the, other peop on the other person as well. You compel the other person as well. You disciple the other person as well to have the same vision of reaching out. Share the vision. As you share it, it will grow. 
Share the vision. As you share it, it will become more meaningful in your life. Share the vision. The more you share, the more it will arrest you. The more it will cancel the non-essentials away from your life. And this will be the priority of your life. The primary thing in your life. The thing that moves you and challenges you and motivates you and drives you. Share it. It grows by sharing. Share it. It becomes more meaningful by sharing. Share it. It becomes something very, very deep that can never be erased from your life by sharing and move others to passion for souls. Number six, be a companion of men and women with like vision. If you go with the people that are not interested, not interested in the work of God, not interested in fulfilling the vision, not interested in winning souls, not interested in um, helping anybody to come to the kingdom of God. If you are a friend to people that will always say, well, we're busy too much. Jesus was busy too much. The apostles of the Lord were busy too much. And Paul, the apostle, he didn't have a breathing space. He was busy too much. Well, don't we have to rest? Well, our resting time is in heaven. Jesus set his face as a flint. Wanted to go to Jerusalem. And if you are moving with people that are always grumbling and complaining, the people that are always saying, the work of God is demanding too much. The word of God, the work of God is demanding too much time. And we're too serious about this, uh, uh, church growth and evangelizing and the great commission. Are we the only people in the world that are going to win the world for Christ? If you move with such people, they'll kill you. Your spirit will be dead. The vision will be blotted away. All the time they will be cautioning you. They will be, tell they will be telling you, go slow. You're doing too much. You're loving God too much. You're giving God too much time. You're giving God too much money. You're taking care of converts too much. You're trying to do a lot in a little time. Take care so you don't die early. Well, Jesus died at three and a half years of age. But yet he's still the ancient of days. But he did everything that the Lord wanted him to do. Father, glorify thyself in me. I've glorified thee on the earth. The work that you have given me to do, I've finished it. That's what matters. Whether 33 years or 43 years or 73 years, what matters is the work you have given me on earth, I've finished it. You might finish it at 23. That's enough. You finish it at 73. That's enough. You finish it at 90. That's all right. The work you have given me to do, I have finished it. But you know, there are people that will tell you, we're working too much. We're loving too much, we're running too much, we're singing too much, we're serving the Lord too much, and they drag you back. And you, you ask them and you say, brother, were you around for that workers meeting? No, I wasn't there. Oh, you know that I don't just run when, when they say run, run, run. You know, I take it slowly, I take it calmly, I do what I like to do. I'm serving God. Were you there in the morning? That was too early for me to wake up and come here. And at 8.30, they put the morning session. And they knew where they put us to lay. No, I didn't. I didn't show. I just took my time and, and came when I wanted to come. Be mindful, be careful of such people. Very, very careful of such people. They'll make you backslide. They've gone already, but they don't know they have gone. But they smile and they say, well, I know how I am, where I am with the Lord now. Just all right with the Lord. Just all right with the Lord. That's what Saul said unto Samuel. Samuel, we have done the things that you have told us to do. We are all right with the Lord. And Samuel said, how about the bleating of the sheep I hear? Oh, well, that's nothing. That's not a big deal. The people took that to sacrifice to your God. That's what made God to reject him as king. He died. He committed suicide. Be very careful. Be careful of those people that will say, it's too much, the fire is too hot, the work is too much, and the giving is too much. We cannot do this. We cannot do this. You have a single life to spend. Spend it for God. Squander it for God. Labor for the Lord while it is yet day. And make sure that you are a companion of men and women that are not idle. Men and women that are of like passion, like vision. Men of the past, stay with Moses and, say, and see how busy and just be like that. Stay with Elijah, stay with Joshua, stay, stay with the people of old and read books of people like William Booth of the Salvation Army, the people that carried, uh, that carried the gospel of fire and blood 
And they went in all the places of England. And they were going about and they were preaching the gospel. Read about people like uh, uh, Charles Finney, who was a lawyer, a competent, accomplished lawyer. And yet he forsook everything. He said, I cannot argue any case anymore. I can only argue for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he became a great evangelist, a great revivalist, and went about preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with such people like John Wesley that said, The whole of the world is my parish. And he preached many times every day for 50 years continuously without stopping. Be a companion of those people and read about them, about their autobiographies. Read about them, about the work that they did in all the places where they were. And you have us, we are still alive. Learn about a general superintendent. I just preach until there is no more strength. And I just keep on laboring. Oh yes, I know people want me, but I avoid them. Oh, they tell me, don't you think that is too much? Don't you think that uh, that is too great? Don't you think that you go slow a little bit? They don't know how many people are perishing every day. Learn from people like me. Learn from people like your set overseers, like your pastors. The people that are reaching out. The people that will not rest. The people that will not sleep. The people that will not fold their hands. The people that will not shut their mouth. The people that will reach out and they will say, While there is breath in me, where there is light during the day, I'm going to walk the work of the Lord until the work is finished. Until the work is finished, learn and do not be lazy. Learn, do not be idle. Do not allow the people that are cautioning us. I'm not talking of outsiders. I'm talking of some unfortunate members of deeper life. They have no vision. They have no goal. All they're thinking about is that it's too much. It's too much. It's too much. Talk about tithes and offering. It's too much. Talk about evangelism, it's too much. Talk about establishing branch churches, it's too much. Talk about uh, going the word of God, having a retreat, it is, are we going for another retreat again? It's too much. Talk about general retreat, it is too much. Where will the people sleep? What food shall they eat? That's all they are considering. They are not considering the necessity of bringing the people to maturity. They are not considering the necessity of bringing the people into the kingdom of God. Where shall they sleep? Where, what shall they eat? Are they going to sit on the ground? Well, if they do, praise the Lord for it. In the meetings of Jesus, for three whole days, no feeding at all. And no place for accommodation either. And it was at the end of the whole meeting for three days that Jesus said, Apostles, disciples, what are these people going to eat? Do you have anything there? Think about that. That they have been there for three days. There was nothing to eat. If we did that today, just like Jesus, some people would leave. They would say, I cannot be a church like that. They are a bunch of mad fellows. Do you know that for the first day, they didn't even prepare the people that will cook. They didn't even prepare any food at all. What type of administration is that? That's Jesus' administration. The administration you think you know is the one that came from college. Is the one that came from secular people. But the administration that counts the word of God... The administration that counts the things of God above everything that is secular, everything that is earthly. Oh, that is divine. You still have a long way to go. But there are people like that. Avoid them. Don't talk with them. Tell them if they have any problem, let them go to God and pray. If they want to be slow, you want to be fast. I'm not a companion of the people that are slow and sluggish and idle and indolent. I will never do anything major for the Lord in, the, in their single lives. I want to run faster if I could. I want to preach more if I could. I want to fast more if I could. I want to do things that I've been doing more if I could. And if there's any new assignment, I say, Lord, thy will be done. How about you? You want to do more for God? I said, you want to do more for God? And then set your face like a flint by Jesus Christ. And Paul the Apostle, you know what he said? In Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I sometimes hear people, people in deeper life, and they say, Paul the Apostle and all those other people, they turned the world upside down. And they say, we are going to turn the world upside down. Not you, not you, not you in your present state. Turn the world upside down. You are easily moved by difficulty. 
easily moved by hunger, easily moved by any opposition, easily moved by any little inconvenience, easily moved by ordinary mosquito biting you, easily moved by taking a long journey, easily moved when the boss is not ready in time. You cannot turn the world upside down. The people that will turn the world upside down in this generation, they are the people that can be on the side of Paul the Apostle, and they will say, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life, anything dear unto me. There's only one thing I'm watching after, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. If you're going to be among the group, among the people that will turn the world upside down, you need to actually set your face as a flint and say, Lord, only this single life I'm going to use for the glory of your name. I'm going to evangelize. I'm going to preach. In the houses, on the streets, everywhere I get opportunity, I am going to preach. Persecution may come, I'll suffer it and keep on preaching. Opposition may come, I'll take it and keep on preaching. Misunderstanding may come, I'll take it and keep on preaching. Others may just disagree with my pattern of life, I will take it, I'll keep on preaching. There may even come beating and strife from the Jews or from the false brethren. I will take it and keep on preaching. There may be people that will gossip. I'll take everything and keep on preaching. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life, my future, my blood, anything dear unto me. There's only one thing I'm taking care of. There's a ministry for me to fulfill. There's a work for me to do. And I want to finish it. Those who are companions of Paul like that, who are going to be able to see on the last day, have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. Can those people stand up? You're going to be like Paul the Apostle. And you're going to say, none of these things move me. The gossips in the states, the oppositions of your relative, the persecution of the people in your place of work, of the other students, of the other workers, none of these things move me. You have a ministry, you have a work to do, and you are going to finish it before the Lord Jesus comes so that you can say, King Agrippa, or whoever it is, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. Rise up on your feet and tell the Lord and consecrate your life and keep the vision. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Our Father, we bless your name very much for this uh, workers' retreat. We glorify it because when we started last Wednesday, our expectations, expectations were very high. And we thank you because you have never disappointed us. We glorify it because all the transformation that we need in our lives, you are giving to all of us. We bless you for the message of this morning. And we thank you for giving us the vision of rest, the one we have lost. Everlasting Father, we are praying that as you have commissioned us to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the country, we shall never be disobedient in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, there are many, many distractions coming to our lives today. The world, position, honor, one thing or the other. Father, we are praying that any hindrance that will hinder us from preaching the word of God, from giving our lives to the people, take it away in Jesus' name. In the churches today, people are not missionary minded. They don't want to preach. They want to enjoy. They want to rule. They want to control people. Everlasting Father, this spirit that has come into the church, the spirit of the world, take it out of our lives in Jesus' name. You have touched us. We don't want to hear the word of God and then get back home and just change. Father, we are praying that all that we have had this period in the seminar, even the message of this morning, we will register permanently in our lives in Jesus' name. Paul was able to give the testimony when he was about to leave the world, that he has finished the course, he has finished his race. Everlasting Father, we are praying that by and by, whether Jesus will come tomorrow or he will delay, at any time we are going to face you, we shall never regret in Jesus' name. We are praying that the effect of this retreat will be seen all over the country in Jesus' name. Father, the Lord of glory, we are depending on you. Your grace is sufficient. Everlasting Father, we are ever. We have made them in any mistake, or we have sinned against you, or leadership of the church. Forgive all of us in Jesus' name. Every spirit of discouragement, despondency, tiredness, take it away from our lives in Jesus' name. 